his first Tuesdays, a partnership between the library and the bookstore. Apparently, Becky used to do this some time ago, and it kind of fell apart. And I was thrilled last year, a year and a half ago, when she called me up and said, hey, let's do this again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, part of the library's mission is to support local authors. And uh, so we're thrilled to be able to do this. Uh, Becky couldn't be here tonight, but she wanted to thank you for coming. This event is one of the series that is presented in partnership, as I just said, with the bookstore and us. Uh, it started in January of 2023 with the express purpose of presenting Vermont authors. Um, we have welcomed poets, novelists, memorists, writers of narrative fiction. If you're interested in a full list of who's been here or who's coming, you can, right now you can see that on the bookstore website and it will be linked to mine. She just did this. So it'll be linked to ours too, but you can always find it at uh, VBS. I think it's vermontbookshop.com if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> so. Uh, before I introduce, I'm going to just shamelessly plug library programs for a quick second here. <laughs> I've got the uh, New York Crimean Tartar Ensemble, which I'm thrilled. They just reached out to me out of the blue. They're going to be here on Saturday the 17th at 3 o'clock playing some traditional music. Uh, as part of, some of you may be familiar with the former uh, First Wednesdays program, which is now um, called Snapshot. I've got a really excellent interview if this is a virtual event you have to sign up at the vermont humanities site if you're interested it's called becoming a, an explorer of social change and jerome moore is the man who's going to be the speaker who and he runs a podcast and i got to meet him on zoom last week and he seems amazing i am very excited about this so i encourage you to check that out no 21st okay sorry and then on uh, February 22nd, I am having a Climate Future Film Festival, 10 short films. It's uh, based in Rhode Island. They're billing it as Bill McKibben is a judge. I'm pretty sure this is just one of the bajillions of things he says yes to because he's a good man. Mm -hmm. I am not billing it as a Bill McKibben event because that doesn't seem right to me. So those are some things you can find out all of more on our website. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Jackie Lennox Tuxell. Jackie has lived in places as diverse as China, where she was born to medical missionary parents, West Virginia, where she grew up, Alaska, which became her sole place, New Hampshire, where she began 35 years of environmental work, and for the past 33 years, in the shadow of Mount Abe in Lincoln, Vermont. Jackie graduated cum laude with a BS in biology from Muskingum College and finished coursework for a master's degree at the University of New Hampshire. She has a son in Washington State and a daughter in Vermont. Whispers from the Valley of the Yak is her first book, and we are thrilled to have you. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for coming out tonight, and I'm glad the weather cooperated. <laughs> and uh, thanks to the library and also to the bookshop, Vermont Bookshop, for sponsoring. Oh, I forgot to say, you can buy books at the end of the program, and Jackie will sign them. We'll hold a hostage. And you can have a bookmark for your book. <laughs> so, um, I really, yeah, as I said, I really appreciate everyone coming out. And I want to start just by uh, giving a few of my, the themes in my book. This is not a simple story. Um, and uh, I, have, I have several themes that are interwoven throughout the book. And um, even, and I'll just go through them briefly, even though I have no memories of living in China, I was two and a half when, when my family left, um, uh, being born in China shaped me. And I'll talk about each of these in a little more detail. Then living in Alaska as a young adult, um, uh, just married and, and with little kids, was a life-changing experience for me. Um, and as Renee said, it is my sole place. It was my, that's where it became my sole place and it's really still my sole place. And then um, because of, of my childhood, um, my mother, my mother, um, was subject to verbal rages, and so I did not, um, I did not do the usual imaginative things that kids do when they're when they're young. You know, where they they play play um, in imaginative ways about being a nurse or a teacher or things like that, where they just live in their imagination. I 
the way I coped with my childhood was to uh, really monitor what was going on around me. And I needed to be sure that I didn't inadvertently say something or do something that would make my mother upset. And so that's, uh, that was my mode of getting through um, uh, my childhood. And because of all of that, I uh, did not um, understand who I was um, and what I wanted from life. Um, even at, into college and, and, and being um, you know, about to graduate or coming into my last year, my senior year, I didn't know who I was. And the easiest thing back then, this was in 1963, was to marry my college sweetheart. And a lot of, a lot of people did that. Um, and for me, it was, it, it meant that I didn't have to make those tough decisions and really think about what, how I would live by myself and how I would support myself. So, um, uh, I'm gonna, this is, this is the map um, of the area of China that um, I have, um, that my family um, has lived in. And it's, this is Sichuan province. Let me see if I can. Okay, um, Sichuan province, it's in the, the far western part of, of China. It, uh, the, the whole western part um, where the Minyakanka is, that mountain, um, that's on the eastern rim of the Tibetan Plateau. And uh, so we're going to be in that air discussing the, air, the things that went on with my family in that area between Chengdu and, and the Minyakanka. I saw you. You got your photo. So oh, yeah. Your photo. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I have to get get it back there. So the story begins with my parents, John and Cora Lennox. Um, they met in 1929 in Philadelphia. My father had completed his postdoctoral <coughs> medical training uh, for internal medicine. He was in his last year. Sorry, he hadn't completed it. And he had just been um, appointed by the American Baptist Foreign Mission Board to teach at West China Union University in Chengdu, teach medicine. And my mother um, was uh, in her first year of medical school when they met. Uh, at, when, this, was, this was all in Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh, sorry. Philadelphia. Um, uh, she was in her first year of medical school. and. They had a whirlwind um, courtship in the spring of 1930. And then dad asked her if she would pack her trunk and go to China with him. That's, that was his proposal. And uh, she did. And um, they married in uh, uh, September 1930 and immediately left for China. Took a, a train across the, the uh, country to Vancouver and BC where they got on a, uh, an ocean liner to cross the Pacific. And when they got to Shanghai, they just continued on smaller and smaller boats up the Yangtze River and, and tributaries mm -hmm. until they finally got to, um, to Chengdu. <coughs> and their first two years there was spent in language study because all of the classes were, were taught in Chinese mm -hmm. at, at the university. So my father had to learn how to speak Chinese, and my mother had to understand Chinese and speak Chinese too, um, uh, so that she could complete her degree. And uh, just a little bit about the university. Um, it opened in 1910, and the, the faculty is international and interdenominational. Um, West China Union University was one of six Union universities in China that were staffed by various denominations collaborating together. And for um, uh, West, West China Union University, the, the largest contingent was Canadian Methodist Episcopals, and then American Baptists, and then um, British Quakers. So it was a very cosmopolitan uh, for being really way in the boonies at that, in the early 1930s. It was a very cosmopolitan place. And they, um, they made um, friends that, that, uh, from all those countries. Um, and those friendships continued after we left China. 
And in the summer of 1932, sorry, I, was, um, I don't know if you can see that, um, they, they made a trek into eastern Tibet um, after they were finished and before they started their official duties. And um, the, the big um, adventure that they had on that trek was well, they had just been, they'd taken one uh, trip on horseback into the grasslands of Tibet for about six days. And they came back to uh, this little um, village called Kangding, which is a, was a trading um, uh, village, uh, Chinese and Tibetans. And they were, they were staying at the China Inland Mission compound. Um, that was a, a, a non-denominational Christian um, missionaries were, would staff the China Inland Mission stations. And while they, my parents were there trying to figure out what they were going to do for the last several weeks of their, uh, of their trip up there, their time up in Tibet, um, these two men who were part of a, a mountaineering expedition that had come to measure and climb the Minyagonka um, came into the compound and they were looking for someone who could, they had hired a Tibetan cook who they couldn't communicate with. And they needed someone who would, who could understand Chinese and um, uh, teach the cook how to cook for Westerners. Mm -hmm. And always also help set up a base camp for uh, the period that the, the, these two men were making um, uh, measurements, taking measurements from various vantage po points. So um, my ever adventurous dad uh, volunteered the two of them to to do this, and um, and I should say that one of the reasons the expedition had had come was because there was some question as to whether the Minyagonko was thirty thousand feet high, which had made it would have made it higher than Mount Everest. So um, they had come to settle how how high that mountain was. And I don't know, can you see the little bit of the mountain, that the snow peak that is, um, you know, there are clouds? Okay, that's, that's the important part because, um, uh, and I, I just was intrigued by their story right from the beginning as a kid because my, my father just was a wonderful storyteller and, and I, I, this was my favorite story. So two quick time markers. My mother graduated in 1936 and her first job or first position, excuse me, position, I would say, um, was as the physician to the women students of the university. Mm -hmm. And then she, um, she had a, a series of other jobs. You know, one that I remember was um, she, she was in charge of the, the tuber tuberculosis treatment uh, mm -hmm. there at, the, at the, um, the medical center. And then by 19, um, uh, early, very early 1945, uh, when we uh, left to return to the to the U.S., um, there were three of us kids, um, <laughs> and I when I'm the middle child um, on the right there. First reading. So I am um, going to read from the first chapter when um, in 1980 my parents and I went to China. And I had, um, I had become, as an adult, had become increasingly curious about my birth country. I had rejected it as a child because it made me different. But I had become increasingly curious and, and um, uh, every time I visited my parents, I would study their black and white photos and that type of thing. So I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to see what it was like too. So. Um, our plane taxied to a stop in front of a drab concrete terminal. And I should say this is, takes place in Chengdu. <clears throat> I stood and took a deep breath, gathered my travel bag and camera, and followed my parents up the aisle toward the door. Waiting our turn to descend the stairs, Mom gave me a tight smile, fidgeting with her still naturally blonde hair. Dad leaned toward me, gleeful, his blue eyes crinkling. Are you ready for this, Jackie? as ready as I'll ever be, I guess. At the doorway, I glimpsed flat agricultural fields stretching into a distant haze and stepped down into the steamy subtropical air of a sunny spring day. Reaching the tarmac, 
I moved briskly to keep up with my eager parents as they strode toward the terminal door. Four Chinese people waited just inside, all dressed in dark gray Mao-style jackets and pants. Only their heights defined a difference. The two women diminutive, the two men both a head taller. All four were scanning the incoming travelers, mostly Westerners. I watched their expressions transform from somber concentration to elation when they recognized my parents. Mom, proceeding apace and not expecting an airport welcome, started to rush by. Mom, I said, and put my hand on her shoulder. Then she recognized them. The women bowed shyly as my mother reached toward them. They clutched hands, all three smiling and crying at the same time. Dad, shorter than the two men, beamed and shook their hands enthusiastically. A lively conversation in Chinese broke out, punctuated by hand gestures and laughs. Dad stopped talking briefly to introduce me in English. The four were mom's medical school classmates and dad's former medical students at West China Union University. I shook hands with them and they resumed their conversation as passengers from our flight continued to trickle by. I stood outside their circle, transfixed excuse me, by the women's tender, poignant reunion. My mother's constant mask of stress had fallen away, leaving only joy. I could not recall her ever showing love so openly to me or my siblings, or even to dad. My eyes pooled as I backed away and leaned against the beige wall. My chest tightened as if in a vice, and time slowed down. I saw only what was before me, my mother chattering away with her friends, delight emanating from her every look and gesture. I was stunned to my core. Who was this woman? Certainly not the mother I'd grown up with. So um, this is my cheat, cheat sheet. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I don't either go down a rabbit hole and, or forget something. Um, so this is just some, some things from um, you know, my, my childhood. So um, when we returned to the U.S., my parents took a year to look for places to, to live. And um, they were determined to find a place where mom could work too. Dad was very supportive of her. And um, we ended up settling in a small West Virginia town where there was a regional medical clinic and openings for both of them, both my parents. And um, I just felt, when I, especially when I started school at, at six years old, I just felt different from everyone else. I mean, I wasn't speaking the, the local dialect. Um, I, um, uh, I, my parents worked, my mother worked, which was unusual after World War II. Um, uh, they, they spoke Chinese in public, which mortified me. They <laughs> liked to give speeches to, to just explain China to, uh, to the people in my community because um, people didn't know anything about China and, and there was all this red China in the news. And so, so they, were, they wanted to um, uh, tell a different story about China. And then um, they decorated our house with all their Chinese things mm -hmm. because they wanted to keep uh, China alive for themselves. They stayed fluent so that they, they could, um, they, they hoped that one day they would be able to go back. Um, but for me, having this um, house which was just filled with Chinese things was just embarrassing. You know, it's crazy. You know, some of the some of the, some of my friends would have loved the dragons and things like that that they that they had around. Um, and then the difficult childhood. Um, I mentioned that before. You know, with my mother um, uh, being uh, verbally abusive, um, and and it really was Dad's stories, my father's stories, that pulled me through uh, my childhood. Um, he was a wonderful storyteller. Little self-understanding, I believe I talked about that. And um, uh, by the end of 
college, I was in love and, and married my, my uh, college sweetheart. So I didn't have to worry about what I did, um, you know, how I, what I was doing next. And uh, this is the painting that I grew up with in, um, um, as a child. And so in addition, to, in addition to having Dad's stories about mountains that were just really, that I loved, I had a visual image of what uh, mountains, really big mountains, were like. And that, um, that really was um, something that um, uh, uh, meant a lot to me. It now hangs in my house. And when um, my, my husband went to medical school, I worked during that period, um, and then uh, he went into the military, and after internship, he was assigned to Kodiak Island. And so here, I had the opportunity to, <laughs> to live surrounded by mountains, uh, beautiful mountains. And <clears throat> it was, um, it, our kids were small, it was just a wonderful um, place to um, to be um, at that point in my life, I was starting to heal, to feel the healing power of nature. Um, uh, just you know, healing from the, all the the verbal abuse of, of my childhood, and just in at that time, Kodiak had 40 miles of of mostly um, dirt roads. There was only six miles uh, between the the base and the and the town. And um, a lot of people there on, on, on the military base um, hated it because they were so confined to this small area. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was just wonderful, you know, the constant um, adventures and outdoor activities. I just, I just loved it and loved doing it with my kids. And the even even <laughs> changing a tire is, is wow. um, <laughs> adventurous. How about um, the bear? What? The bear. Um, I only saw bears from the airplane. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, um, I was, uh, we, ha we, there was a, a neighboring island that was national forest and there was a, there was a camp there and we went there once and I, um, <clears throat> I, I, it was beautiful and I went out along this trail that was going by the, by the, the stream. <laughs> it was, it was, um, a time when the, the salmon were just um, choking the stream. And I walked out, I didn't walk very far, my kids were with me, and all of a sudden I realized I was seeing salmon carcasses. And I thought, <laughs> I, I said to the kids, oh, it's time for us to turn around and go back. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that, but other than seeing bears from a boat, uh, you know, that, that was that same time, I, I never saw them um, on, on a regular basis. They were they were on um, the other side of the mountains, and then um, after um, doing a brief uh, right, um, um, a residency, my, my um, husband did a residency in ophthalmology. We moved back to Anchorage, and then living in Anchorage, um, uh, I really was introduced to the really big mountains mm -hmm. and the braided rivers and and just the the gorgeous landscapes that just went on and on. <clears throat> and one of the things that I really enjoyed about, um, this is Denali, and, um, formerly Mount McKinley, if, the, if, the name, if that is more familiar to you. So the highest mountain in, in, um, uh, uh, in North America. And um, uh, there, you can see a little bit of the road there, and the Park Service has a bus that goes through the park. And they will stop if you've been, um, if you're by the side of the road, you've taken a, a hike or something like that. And you can really get a sense of what the wilderness is like without having to, to go backpacking or anything that's a big deal. You know, now, I, I mean, I love backpacking, but you don't, you don't have to do that to get a sense of what the wilderness is like. It's an amazing place. And um, here you see my kids are a little bit bigger and and this doesn't come out very well, but the mountain is in the background. Oh, no. um, the, light isn't, the light isn't good. And just amazing, amazing landscapes. And being there and, and seeing my kids really pick up on all of the, the nature activities just was wonderful for me. And um, that's why, as I said, by the time 
um, uh, we were living in Anchorage. It was Alaska is my sole place. And um, then I also I also started doing environmental work there as a as a volunteer, um, and and that's where I I found my passion for environmental work. So there were a lot of reasons why why I had these ties to Alaska, and just as I was really understanding who I was and what I wanted in life. Uh, my husband came to me and said, "We're moving. <laughs> I can't live this far away from my from my um, family." And the thing that was really upsetting to me was that he made all his plans, concrete plans, before he said anything to me. Ooh. So um, I I really didn't have any choice but to um, to go along if I wanted to keep the family together. Second reading. So I um, am going to um, read about, um, let me get a sense of what Alaska meant to me. If you didn't already. <laughs> so um, I had said to him that I could not, I literally could not get on a bus, or sorry, on a plane and leave Alaska. And I said, we have to, we have to drive back. And so what we did was to um, uh, buy a van and um, a camper and um, drive across the country mm -hmm. to New Hampshire, where we were, Concord, New Hampshire, where we were going to be living. <clears throat> uh, so this is picking up from um, the last visit to Denali National Park before leaving. On our last morning in the park, we woke to a dusting of snow. Packing up in the cold, we headed toward the park entrance. Along the way, I spotted four caribou trotting effortlessly over the tundra. With antlers in velvet, nut brown winter coats, and creamy neck ruffs, they were magnificent against the backdrop of snow touched autumnal ground cover. They moved with a lightness as if they had springs in their feet. Leaving Denali, we began our long trek south in the camper along the Alaska Highway through Canada and then east across the plains. I lived in the moment of our adventure, glad I'd insisted we drive instead of flying across the country. Reaching New York State, upstate New York, at September's end, we stopped to see Tom's relatives and picked up the red Volkswagen Rabbit he had purchased in June. The next day, the last of our journey, Tom and Johnny climbed into the camper while I drove the rabbit with Steph. Crossing the Connecticut River into New Hampshire, I was alone with my thoughts as Steph slept. New Hampshire's landscape was pleasing. Scenic vistas, forested mountains, quaint villages. But it seemed compact and tame. The immense scale and wildness of Alaska, the endless mountains, broad valleys, braided glacial rivers, and iconic wildlife defined the state's profound impact on my soul. Tears, dreams, tears streamed down my face as I silently gave way to my grief. I didn't know what was in store for the future or for my marriage, but I wept for what I had lost. If I'd understood then the circumstances surrounding my parents' departure from China, I would have seen the parallel to Dad's leaving a situation that had been so rewarding for him. There was even a similarity in the landscapes we each had to leave, the mountains and rugged terrain that promised adventure. I wish I could have talked with him about these similarities, but this insight came later, after his death. I did, however, have his wisdom to guide me. My father, giving up what he had loved in China, looked for the benefits and the opportunities Oops, I lost me. Offered by change and new experiences. He didn't dwell on what he'd left behind, but incorporated what he had valued from past experiences in creating a new path. In my own way, I kept Alaska in my heart and moved forward into my new life. Denali would remain a touchstone for me, emblematic of the role Alaska had played in my personal and professional growth.
So um, we're going back to China, um, 1980. Um, this is um, this is not in Chengdu, but it, it shows what the um, what the the cities were like at that time. And I don't know how many of you have been to China. Okay. Two. I was just curious, yeah. what year did you have to leave Alaska? Uh, 1976. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, when before we before we left, my parents and I talked about. So w wonder what we're going to find. You know, how much has China changed? And I was curious about all of that. And what what we found was that China really hadn't changed that much. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there are two things that that show this here. Um, the low profile of the cities. I mean, even in 1980, um, uh, oh my gosh, there must have been at least 800,000 people living in Chengdu. It was a big city, and it was the, the capital of the, the provincial capital. Um, but uh, there were no elevators, except in maybe some really um, big cities where some hotels had, had um, elevators. So um, people, didn't want to climb much more than six stories, you know, in, in taking groceries back to their to their apartments. Um, so the low pri profile is one thing, and then all the bicycles and yeah. no cars. And um, this car in the front um, is undoubtedly uh, belongs to an official or an official that has a, a driver who who drives him around because um, that's the only uh, people in 1980 that had cars. Um, the one thing that you can't see that, that, that was different, and all of this was in conversations with my parents throughout the trip, um, they didn't see the, the, all the, the health issues that they, that they had um, in the 1930s and 40s. Um, people, people were generally healthy, much healthier. And they weren't, you didn't see the dire poverty as much um, because it, it just was such an issue back in the 30s and 40s. And um, so they felt that the people were better off because of that. And another thing for me was just seeing the black and the old black and white photos come to life in full yeah. in full color, and it was absolutely wonderful. My father said that this was the most beautiful of the Union universities because a lot of them were block blocky buildings, you know. Just and this one incorporated um, Chinese design in it, and um, it it was really a beautiful campus. Mm. Now, two quick things um, important to the story. Um, in the, so this is now um, 11 years later. My parents are older. Um, they finally had all their things consolidated in one place. And while helping them go through some of their boxes, I uncovered carbon copies of the letters that they had written home from China to their parents and their, their families. And this was an amazing discovery. It was, um, it was, how many of you know what onion skin paper is? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. This, um, the, these letters were so fragile. You know, they, the paper was yellowed, um, the corners were crumbling, um, there was um, uh, typing from edge to edge, sometimes uh, front and back, um, and I, I just felt like this is a, family treasure, and I looked through enough to know that uh, finding a couple of dad's stories, um, that the, the, the letters had a freshness, because it wasn't dad telling the stories remembering back 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I asked them if I could take them home and transcribe them, and they were delighted that I, that I did that. And the process took a while because I was I was working there full time and at that point full time and and <clears throat> um, so I was doing it in the evenings, but um, it it I absorbed their stories, the the their life. Um, I I got to see what my parents were like um, early in their marriage um, and how their relationship changed. It was just it was a 
you know, it was a gift to me because few people get a sense of what their parents are like um, before they, they're dealing with all of the issues of parenting and that type of thing. Um, and I especially, um, uh, when, I, when I read the, um, the story of their trip to the, into the Minigonka, I said, I have to go there. And that became number one thing on my bucket list. And so in 2007, I made that, it was a family pilgrimage. I made it with my, with my two kids and my niece. So the rest of, the, of this is going to be about that. Can I ask you a question, Jack? Yes. On the letters that you transcribed, were they all written by your dad, or did your mom write some? A mom, too. Mom yeah, did okay. more in, um, in, the, in the 1940s, um, with the war going on. Mm -hmm. um, and there was so much going on there, because there were like, and, this, and it wasn't just in, in Chengdu that this happened, but um, as the Japanese overran the eastern provinces, some of the universities would just pick everything up, the students and faculty, and they would move farther west to other universities. And so there were like six different schools that moved there. You know, two of them were medical schools and, and you know, just from farther east. So the campus was very crowded. Dad had to take on additional um, uh, supervisory um, or administrative roles. And um, mom, Mom didn't like it, but uh, because she, my sister was born in 1940, and I in 1942, and my brother in 1944, she was restricted in how much she worked, uh, but she was home more, and so she, they, they kind of um, shared the duties. Mm -hmm. that, but in the early, in the early years, the first decade anyway, Dad did way more than, mm -hmm. than Mom. Mm -hmm. Answer your question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, I mentioned I mentioned Kanding. That is halfway up to the Tibetan Plateau. That's the that's the the one two three four the fourth town there. Um, and so that you will be will be saying about. But one thing I want to mention about this is that Chengdu is on the plain on a plain that is flat and it's agricultural land. Um, and as you move west. You first come into rolling hills, like um, in Yang'an, the second, the second town. Um, that's a tea growing area. And um, the hills are rolling, and just lots of tea plantations. And then um, by the time you get to Luding and that river, um, that is the Dadu River, that's when you really start up into the Tibetan Plateau. And, and the, the ruggedness of the mountains just increases. And um, it's spectacular country um, in there. So um, uh, yeah, it's it's yeah. Um, How many miles from but, Chengdu to Minyakan? From Chengdu to Kangding is 90 miles. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when I was arranging um, with a travel agent for a driver and mm -hmm. and a vehicle to take us. Um, they, he first was going to take me on a four-lane road. Because there's a four-lane road. I said, no. <laughs> no four-lane roads. I, you know, because I could get there in one day, and that wasn't how I wanted to yeah. do it. So, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's not that far a distant, mm. distance. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, particularly in 1932, it was, it was yeah. quite, a, quite a walk. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I should say, they didn't just... They did a lot of walking, a lot more than most missionaries did at that time. But they did have a couple of porters that would, would carry them in the, on, um, you know, the, what Dad called huagars. Um, and it would be, so they would, they, it was like a swing with a, 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 a bamboo pole across their shoulders and there'd be a sling coming from the, from the hanging from the, the um, porter in the front and porter in the back. And uh, so they did, they did um, ride in those some. It wasn't all. Dad was more apt to walk than, than mm -hmm. Mom. She, she rode in it more. So I wanted to show you, these are from different eras, but I wanted to show you the kind of uh, choice, they, uh, the roads they traveled. Mm -hmm. um, so particularly, I mean, these roads and like the, the um, stone, Dad called it a road. Um, the stone walkway there, those were 
the kind of roads that they had, had used for centuries and centuries, um, uh, 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 getting from place to place. And um, this, I should say that this one is like a Cadillac of roads mm -hmm. because of the upkeep and everything, and, and, and it's manicured. So my parents were, um, weren't, uh, they're, they're what they called it, the, the rock road wouldn't have been um, that nicely taken care of. But then once they got into Tibet, they were, they were, um, these were, this was an example of the kind of roads they were, were walking on, just very, very rocky, and that would be difficult too. But luckily, at that point, they were riding horses. Mm -hmm. they, um, <clears throat> that's how they traveled once they got into, um, into Tibet. And um, so I, um, Mr. Chen, the driver, was um, he'd been told that he shouldn't take the four lane road, um, and I'd given him um, the names of some villages that were um, along the the route in general that my parents had taken, but the names might have been changed and everything too because because they they get they get new names, um, and so he was he was driving us what I realized was the the most direct two-lane road, <laughs> and, and was still one that, that wouldn't take us very long to, to um, get there. Um, but we, soon after we came to the river, the Dadu River, um, the, uh, there was a big barricade that said um, um, the road was closed, and they were building a dam, and so um, um, we, my, my, uh, the kids and I, were really happy when he had to turn around and, and take a side road, and soon we were on a dirt road. And, and, and we, it was, it was beautiful driving along there. Now I have inserted, um, I've inserted this and the next slide because of, because for Vermonters, because this is what <laughs> we're waiting for. <laughs> So oh, the right. next time you encounter a mud hole in your mind, just remember this picture because I've never seen anything approaching that. <laughs> and um, uh, so Mr. Chen was primarily a, a, a driver, not a not a guide. So he didn't have he and I had about the equivalent experience in each other's language. I had taken um, one year at the Middlebury Summer, beginning Chinese at the Middlebury Summer Institute, language institute. So I, I knew some words, um, like one that I used several times on this trip in the car was zao gao, um, which means what a mess. And that would apply <laughs> definitely to this or to some of the traffic jams and overturned vehicles and everything that we have. Are those cabbages have. in that car? Pardon? Are those cabbages? Cabbages, yes. Uh -huh. and, and see, that truck is mired. And I think some of the trucks on up are probably maybe from um, the next village or something that mm -hmm. people can help out, help people out. But, mm -hmm. but when, when we got up, so we're next, and uh, Mr. Mr. Chen was able to just drive through without. Wow. Um, wow. He, he, he drove was, through he, that. I was really glad to have him, a, a real driver rather than a guy, because yeah. he, was able, he was able to get through that without any problem. Oh my God. <laughs> um, so I, here we arrive at the Dadu River, and I had, I had brought some pictures. I don't think I brought this one, but I brought other ones. But because I have looked at um, my parents' photos so often, I recognize that this, the, this is the road on the bottom that my parents traveled. And if you see the, the arrow, the, the shaky arrow <laughs> up there, I don't know if you can see the, the line of the road that goes along. Um, it, those, you know, we were on the same road, and this is after 75 years, um, I, and I just, I just couldn't believe it, but it made me feel good. And then shortly after that, um, we turned up this, the road that goes up this gorge, and if you look at the little arrow down at the bottom, that's, that's where the road is, and there's a, there's a, a truck there. Um, but. This gives you a sense of how rugged the country is there, and the narrowness of the mm -hmm. of the gorges. It's um, it's really amazing, and and this road then brings us into uh, Kangding, um, or it was called Dajinwu, um, in 1932. And um, in 1932, it was a trading town 
um, made up of um, Chinese and Tibetans. Um, it is right on the old tribute road from Lhasa to Beijing. So that, and, and that was, once China had emperors, then, you know, um, Lhasa was sending tribute um, there. So it's a very, very old road, and it's, it's a crossroad. It's, it's where um, the, the, the tea that was brought on horses from farther south in Yunnan province um, came to this town and where the tea was unpacked and um, put onto yaks uh, to travel further into, into Tibet. And um, the tea from around the Yang'an um, area uh, that was on the map earlier, um, those, that tea was transported by people, by, by men and women. Um, who, who would have as much as 380 pounds on their, oh, on their pack, um, carrying it over these steep mountain um, um, roads. So there's a river that goes right through the middle of town. I haven't figured out where it is exactly. Um, it might just go off to the side um, on the old one. Um, but here's what it looks like today. and. Um, uh, on the right hand side you're looking across a bridge and there's on either side of the river there's a road and then there's room for two more streets on either side beyond that before you're right up against this incredibly steep um, uh, uh, hillside slope mountain um, that is unbuildable um, so it's it's quite an amazing town so and there's no suburbs <laughs> well, I, I was about ready to mention that. So, so the, the main part, the, the commercial part of the, of the city um, has, has remained compact, and it's a wonderful place. We had great fun. We stayed there two nights to, to acclimate a little bit. Um, but then, for a couple miles, the river, uh, the, 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 um, the city stretches out along the river. So that's the sub, it's a linear suburb. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so for in, in Kangding we picked up, sorry, we picked up two mountain guides that were required uh, to go into the, if you were going into the um, Minigonka range because um, people have lost their lives on the Minigonka um, and, and that whole range. So the, the government makes you, makes you have two mountain guides. And they're drivers, so we were a two-vehicle two caravan at that point. Um, and here we're on our way to Jedwell Pass. And um, I, I thought there would be some homes or something like that. But there, there weren't at all. And you can see that it really is exactly the same. It's, we're crossing from one side of this drainage to, to the other side. And I, you know, I looked up, up um, um, to the up ahead of me, up north, up, uh, no, it's not north, but, but up towards the pass. And I took a quick photo because I, again, you know, that was, um, yeah, that, it just says I'm on the same path. And when we got up uh, close to the pass, uh, there was this yak hair tent and the yak and yak herders and um, most likely was um, uh, a, a family that had brought their yaks up to the higher elevations, graze on the summer grasses. Um, uh, my parents saw a couple of uh, yak caravans parked, or not parked, but, but uh, uh, camped up in the, mm -hmm. up in the pass. Mm -hmm. And here we are at the, uh, at the pass, and that white structure is a chorten. It is a, um, a, a, a sacred structure in Tibetan Buddhism, it usually contains ashes or bones of some sort. And then underneath all those prayer, prayer flags, all the way around the, the Chorten, um, are prayer rocks. This is a huge money pile. Um, and, and the prayer rocks have um, the, the, the phrase, Om Mani Padme Hum, um, carved onto the, the rocks. Um, and um, if you circle the, the Chorten and the Mani Pile clockwise, you send prayers out into the universe, all of those prayers. And the, and the prayer flags 
send prayers out into the universe too. So. <clears throat> and then we drop down into the, uh, the valley and, and everything changes. Um, the, the Tibetan houses are so different from the Chinese houses and, and um, um, it's all grasslands um, in this valley. <clears throat> And I wanted to, I have the inset there uh, to explain, I wanted to explain the houses. Um, most of them, not all of them, most of them have three stories. Um, the, the ground floor is always for storage and um, shelter for livestock, the yaks or, or horses. And then the upper two floors are, are living quarters. Um, and the open space is, they have a, a, a little, um, uh, altar up there, and they also use that for story, storing the, the dry barley, which is their staple crop. Now, are those Chinese houses or Tibetan? No, these are Tibetan. These are Tibetan. They don't have the, they don't have the upturned turned eaves that the Chinese houses have. And also, the windows are very distinctive. It's, they have this, um, either they, it's, it's just painted white around them, or sometimes they have geometric um, um, stones and painted around the windows. It's, it's very typically, typically Tibetan. And it was harvest time when we arrived, and um, I have to say that I only saw, I saw one truck in a field once. But all of the harvesting, or I should say, you know, 95, 99% of it is done by hand. And where the arrow is, there are two people walking up the walkway, um, just loaded down with um, barley stalks. And it's probably, they're probably women, at least that's what I usually saw, women carrying the load of barley stalks. Uh, and that, that would be one of their villages. Are the houses all made of stone? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Now this, forget the, the contemporary house there. Um, I wanted you to see the, the building over there on the slope because as soon as I saw we we were driving past that and I said, Oh my gosh, Dad mentioned that in the China letters. And so I had I had brought a I printed out an account of 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 his, their trip. And you know, across the stream on the far slope stood a white stone building. Edgar said it was a llama retreat. And kind of the, the red roofs and the white the white building is dis very distinctive, um, um, and, and it's you know it's always related to a monastery or, or um, a retreat like that. And it just it just made me um, I, I felt like my parents were along with me mm -hmm. because um, uh, you know and, and I really am on their on their path. I mean, um, you, I guess I, I cut it off down at the very bottom behind that. Contemporary house is the stream that comes down mm -hmm. through the mm -hmm. through the that valley. Mm -hmm. And now we're in the Valley of the Ack. And I should say that my parents came into um, uh, this valley on horseback with the with the, the uh, two um, expedition members and all their retinue. Um, and and um, there still is no. Um, uh, road over that pass today, and um, we we came in by way of the the lower end of the valley, and um, uh, this this is taken from where we camped, and uh, you can see the yak there. I called it the Valley of the Yak because when my parents came over that uh, that pass, um, they had camped near some Tibetan. Um, uh, Tibetan uh, tents where the, the people had brought the, their yak up into the, the high elevation for the grasses. And, and the, I don't know if this is one of the, the bull yak that, that um, was threatening to fight, but there were two that were threatening mm -hmm. to fight. And so I just, I gave it that name because I did not want to, um, I didn't want to put any, any kind of pressure on the Tibetans who had helped us with um, all of, uh, with this whole journey. Because they, they were so gracious and, and are wanting to be um, 
uh, find the place where my parents had camped. You know, they were, they were so, they, they became a part of the story and they were very interested in all of that. And I didn't want uh, any kind of um, attention on these Tibetans who had, who had helped us in this because this is not the time uh, over in China where, where um, you want um, the Tibetans to have any more um, pressure on them from the Chinese government. This is, um, this was a linear Monty pile, and my father said he had never seen anything like this. That's his photo down at the bottom, and, and up above is um, the one we took. And, and um, again, you know, just amazing to be able to see this um, in the same place. And I showed you one of the, the rocks. Um, and I'm going to leave it here because this is the culmination of the, of the story. And if I, if I tell you what happened there, <laughs> you have the whole story. And so I want you to um, um, buy the book um, <laughs> or, or borrow it from the library. You know, yeah. However, right? I want you, to, read the book. I want you to, to find out what happens. It's a very, it's a wonderful story. Um, and um, I wanted to leave you with the fourth theme of my book, which I didn't want to give away um, in the beginning. And that's that my affinity for China helped me to heal from my, my, my mother's verbal abuse and helped me to find forgiveness for her. And I am going to read one more um, reading, um, and I hope it, I hope it um, satisfies you when I took the ending of the <laughs> this away from you. <clears throat> so this is um, um, the story. Um, I pick it up after Mom's um, memorial service. She died in 1999. My father died in 1997. Mm. Children have only a partial understanding of who their parents are. A child's brain is not equipped to grasp the full measure of a mother or father, much less fathom the intricacies of adult relationships. The tributes from mom's colleagues and the condolences of mom's friends allowed me to gain a more complete picture of my mother. It was not unlike turning a crystal and seeing through a different facet much like witnessing my mother greet her classmates in Chengdu in 1980. I welcomed this more multifaceted view of her as it allowed me to let the mother I grew up with recede in my memory. All these experiences and insights helped me process my grief and enabled me to let go of my childhood memories and the associated guilt and shame. I may always carry inside a yearning to have had a mother who was able to show her more tender feelings. And that's okay, because now I feel only love for her and compassion for the pain she carried in her heart for so long. Not until after the service, arriving home from a grueling 11-hour drive, did I feel the full force of my mother's death. As I inserted the key in the front door, my first thought from force of habit was that I had to call mom and report my safe arrival home. <laughs> she had insisted on each of my visits that I call so she knew I'd, arrived, I'd had arrived safely. Every time this request had graded, I felt it was her way of treating me like a kid. With my hand still on the doorknob, I knew I had it all wrong. Her desire to hear of my safe arrival had come purely for her from her had come purely from her concern for me, from the love she could not show. Never again would she be making that request. Never again would she be at the end of the phone line. Sinking to a chair, I gave in to the fathomless grief washing over me. So that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions. I have to know if you ever were able to heal from your husband dragging you out of <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, um, I, one thing that I have learned in writing this book is that the processing continues. Mm. It doesn't just end when you've, when you've um, 
uh, finished your book, and I, um, I really uh, wished that I had had, um, could go back and change some of my book, because I realized at some point that I haven't given the kinds of things that I said about Alaska. I mentioned that Alaska is my childhood, my, my soul place in, in the book. But I have understood how much more than that it is. And I would have given it a little more um, attention in writing the book. So that was one thing that, that I, as I continued to process. Um, and so what I found, my, my ex-husband um, uh, died a little over two years ago. And what, my son lives in Bellingham, Washington, and I have gone out there on a regular basis. And my ex-husband and, um, and his second wife um, moved there uh, probably about 10 years ago. And um, so I was there when he got a diagnosis of terminal lymphoma and that it was in his brain and non-operable. And um, I, had, I had long ago, you know, it, it just, I, I had just forgotten all, the, all the, the issues between us and everything. And um, so, uh, you know, the family, we all got together as a family whenever I was there. And so I realized when I, um, uh, we had a family gathering after he had gotten his diagnosis, and I realized that um, I no longer carried any of that inside me. You know, the, the forgiveness wasn't just for my mother, but it was for him too. And forgiveness, true forgiveness is an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. I, when I wrote this book, I had an, an intellectual understanding of what forgiveness was. And now I, I know it as a visceral mm -hmm. feeling. It's, it's just, um, it's amazing. Okay. Powerful, very powerful. Many people can't find that. Well, it's a gift to you more so than to the people you're forgiving. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, I mean, I, I just have, I'm no longer living with the anger or the regret or anything like that. You know, your life is, you know, it's all of your, all of everything that happens to you in your life, you are sum total of all of that and the learning that, that comes along with that. Do any of your children live near you? Um, my daughter lives with me. <laughs> <laughs> That's very near. <laughs> that is very near. <laughs> my son, and my son lives in Bellingham, Washington. Mm -hmm. So all the way across the country. I was in Shalino about the same time you were. Uh huh. And you have to give people a sense of how unusual that was. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. I mean, it's like. They had, they had stores for tourists that the Chinese could not go into. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember in 2005 when I, I, I became friends with the daughter of my mother's classmate. And I should say, I, I hadn't said this before, um, my mother was in a medical school class of three men and six women. <laughs> and that, um, that ratio, I mean, maybe there's, I know women, there are more women in medical school now, I've read that, at some point, women surpass men. I don't know if they're up to that ratio yet. Um, but it was highly unusual, and mom, mom had a special friend, and, um, and um, her daughter is about, her oldest daughter is about my age, maybe a year or two younger, and we became very close friends, mm -hmm. and I have to remember what I was talking about. Um, oh, um, I, I decided after a trip that I made in 2005, I was staying with her for, for three weeks because I really wanted to know what life was like for um, everyday Chinese because when you're attached to a tour, yeah. you, don't, you don't get to see that picture. It's just different. You get what um, the Chinese government wants to show you or, mm -hmm. you know, something like that. Um, I mean, it may have eased up for a while, and I think now it's, it's, it's just really closed down. Um, but um, I, I remember she took me into some of the, the stores in her neighborhood. The, you know, the, um, I mean, we looked at cameras, we looked at, at household goods, we looked at books, and she was so proud to show me that and all the things that they had. Um, 
um, that she didn't have um, back in 1980 when, yeah. when I first went back. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yes? I traveled to China in 1983 83? with Peter Siebel, who was then head of the UVM Department of Chinese. Uh -huh. And he was a good friend. Um, the things we saw were amazing. Um, at the Peace Hotel in Shanghai, someone put letters into my hand. Our hand was hanging at my side. And I turned quickly and I saw incredible bleeding in her eye. And I tucked them into my shirt and we talked about that. And he wow. said, Lynn, if they catch you, they'll imprison you. So it, it was really um, unique and I had Wow. Many other experiences that were outside of the government control because we weren't really in in a tourist group. But I that was years ago now, and and the images are clear, crystal clear. Yeah, yeah, that's really that's really something. Yeah. It was. There was a there was a question back behind here. Yes, me. I just wanted to thank you for sharing your story. I think you're very courageous. Yes. Thank you. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, you know, <laughs> I in in writing this, you know, I've kind of processed everything as I said, and, and I have talked to um, a couple of book groups, and if any of you is in a book group and would like to um, read the book, I, I will. I will. Yeah, I'm going to do your book in the fall. I'll get in touch. Okay. You. Yeah, because I I love talking to book groups. I mean, for one thing, I don't have any prep. And I just go in and I say, ask me anything. You know, I mean, really, seriously, ask me anything. <laughs> where, where are your siblings now? Um, my my sister died in 2019 before I was before she saw the book. Mm -hmm. um, I I talked with her about some of the chapters, um, showed them to her, got her input. Um, mm -hmm. She never really recovered from um, our childhood, and. Um, I think that was a part of why she um, died earlier. Mm -hmm. It was just very sad. Um, my brother, I, my brother and I are estranged, mm -hmm. and it's, mm -hmm. it's just I, I'm, you know, I have difficulty communicating with him, um, and I have communicated with him in the past, but he never initiates anything. Um, he has never visited me in my home um, ever since I was married, except for one night when he brought my parents up from Pittsburgh to see my new home in Lincoln, because my parents were, were too, too frail to travel by themselves. And that's the only time he's ever been in my house. And I, you know, my sister and I would say, how could he come from the two people we did? And I, you know. You know, you don't know him, so I, you know, I've been very frank. Mm -hmm. Jackie, do you think I just I've been reading this book by uh, Dr. Bruce Perry that talks a lot about you know early trauma and like the, the way our brain architecture changes or develops over time and like how different things can mitigate that. And so it makes me wonder: Do you think that your brother and sister had a different relationship with your father? Like, do you think your your relationship with your father was? kind of special, like you had a special connection with him, which gave you that solace and, and maybe kind of mitigated this, what you were feeling from your mom. And um, do you think there's any truth to that? Um, yeah, I, I do. Yeah. yeah, that was, that. I needed that. I yeah. didn't have anything, I, I wouldn't have had anything else to, to grab a hold of. And, and the thing is that no one, no one in my um, neighborhood or the, or the this small town where I lived understood that that my mother had rages like that mm. and um, so, it was like a so I was feeling very much alone I mean I didn't even talk um, each of us including my father dealt with that on our own mm. and so your father never talked to you about no it? he didn't he never said you know he, he, I think he would make up for it by mm. by the, the trying to have relationships were that were very close yeah. with us yeah. um, but um, no he never talked about it because he he got he he got it too yeah. you know once once we had grown up and left I mean he was his, he was her primary target and and 
you know, it was, this is something, I mean, I, I talk about it in the book. She was abused as a, yeah. as a, a child, yeah. and um, um, verbally and physically. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. I, and I recognized my grandfather as being, ver I, you know, I didn't know the term verbally abusive, mm -hmm. but I know I didn't, he was not a, a warm, <laughs> fuzzy grandfather, I can tell you that. <laughs> So um, every, every one of uh, my mother and her siblings, all of them, were affected to some extent or another. And my mother, um, uh, at one point she, when she was very ill, um, I think like a, a year, almost a year before she died, um, her doctor put her on antidepressants while she was um, she was delirious, and her doctor put her on antidepressants. And um, this was before I went to China in 2005. And when I came back, those antidepressants had been working, and um, she was a different person. Wow. Oh. She was a different person. That's all she needed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's really sad that it yeah. took it took that long. You made something so beautiful. Out of a tough story. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I mean, I, I think you kind of have to if you're gonna <laughs> if you're gonna be happy. Um, I mean, I was dealing with I, I was dealing with all sorts of things, mm -hmm. and um, including my marriage, which as you might have gathered, uh, <coughs> we split up in 1985. Oh, it's longer than I would have lasted. Yeah. <laughs> it, it I mean, it it. <laughs> It took me a long time to really get my get my act together. Well, well you know, children that care got it right. But you, you did it. Yeah, you thought it was important. You did it. So you did a good job. Well, um, I thank you for that compliment. <laughs> I mean, my my kids have turned out wonderful. Hmm. I mean, I I've always said if I had another one, all the <laughs> all the bad things that could happen to a kid would have. And visited on that child <laughs> because I've always had really good relationships with both of my both of my kids. Very proud of them. Uh, Any more questions? Please, please visit the bookseller in the back and get your very own copy. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Have fun. Thank you.